While Tunis Campbell fought aggressively for black rights, John Roy Lynch moved more cautiously. Lynch had been a house slave in Natchez, Mississippi. After the war, he had learned to read, taught himself photography, and worked his way up in the business. I think he only had about four months of formal schooling, but he's a very bright young man and a fast learner. He listened, and he was also in the photography business, so he heard uh, a lot of people who could afford to have their pictures taken. Lynch's customers talked politics, and he soaked it up, even teaching himself parliamentary law. By 1870, he was a newly elected state legislator walking up the steps of the Mississippi Capitol. He was 22 years old. John R. Lynch is one of those guys who is created by the Reconstruction situation. Opportunities open to him which, could have been in, which would have been inconceivable before this moment. This legislature had some very important work before it. The entire government had to be reconstructed so as to place it in perfect harmony with the new order of things. Black legislators, they're not asking for really radical changes. They're asking for deeply American things. Equality in the courthouse, the right to be on juries, the right to testify on your own behalf. A lot of what these black lawmakers and white Republicans are trying to do, you might almost say, is bring the South into the 19th century. Public school systems, for example. The South didn't have that. Large numbers of Southern whites were illiterate. Reconstruction establishes the first public school systems in the South. Within a year, Mississippi opened 230 new schools for blacks and 252 for whites. There were plans for new hospitals, railroads, but who would pay the bill? Before the Civil War, slave owners had paid most of the taxes. Now, the burden shifted to anyone who owned land, small farmers as well as rich planters. White Southern landowners said, you know, the government take care of colored people. You're crazy. The war had just come to a close, leaving most of the people in an impoverished condition. Their property was in a state of decay. To have the rate of taxation increased was to them a very serious matter. After fierce debate, Lynch and the Republicans managed to pass the tax increase. In state houses and small towns across the South, black officials were transforming daily life for former slaves. As African Americans encountered local government, for the first time in their lives, they were encountering black faces behind the desk, faces that were accepting, faces that knew who they were, what they had been through. There was one thing that white Southerners feared more than anything else. They used one word for lots of different kinds of things. They called it Negro rule. Well, when you have a black sheriff with a gun, that's Negro rule. Sometimes, even if you have a black postmaster who makes white women stand in line to get stamps, that could be Negro rule. It all looks like Negro rule, and it's hard for white Southerners to get a sense of proportion about all this because they considered all of it a violation of the natural order, a violation of the way that the things should be. A shadow land of secret clubs and societies began to take shape. In Mississippi, the White Liners. In Louisiana, the Knights of the White Camellia. And across the South, the Ku Klux Klan. If you grow up in a society 
and where for centuries you have been taught that other people are your racial inferiors. It's very hard to accept the enormous social change involved in their emancipation. Any benefit that accrued to blackness was interpreted as a loss of whiteness. Education, the acquisition of property, was viewed as somehow unnatural. Ku Klux Klan does not see itself as lawlessness, but as the law. Because they do not believe that black men deserve political power or know what to do with it once they have it, they think that it's their right, maybe even their Christian responsibility, to destroy black political power before it has a chance to become too entrenched. Abram Colby had been elected to the Georgia legislature, along with Tunis Campbell. The Democrats wanted to curb his power in the county. They tried bribes, but Colby turned them away. In October of 1869, the Klan set out to teach him a lesson. They were the mercenary forces of the Democrats who were trying to regain power. They were not simply using the ballot because they felt they would lose at the ballot box. They were using violent coercion. They were eliminating their competitors. Colby's attackers could not hide behind their hoods. Some of them were the first class men in our town. One is a lawyer, one a doctor, and some are farmers. I knew the voices of those men as well as I know my own. They would take people out of their houses or their cabins in the dark of the night, strip them out in a road, uh, make them run down the road, make them sometimes lie on a rock where they would be whipped, where men would line up to whip them. Sometimes they would burn parts of them. 